Good morning, Living Hope family. What a blessing it is to be together this morning. As Jim and I think about the multiple blessings that we've been given, we consider Living Hope amongst them. Somehow, some way, we've always found a way to stay together. And that is something that we will truly always cherish. So it doesn't matter if we see one another, if we're in the same building, or if we're even in the same town, somehow, some way, Living Hope is a family. And for that, we've always been grateful. We'd like to say blessings to you all. Thanks, Jack family. It's been said that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And that's because of the incredible sustaining and saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We rejoice in the transformative power of his love and his grace. And as we've experienced that personally, that's part of the reason that we come to worship. We come to sing our praises because we know that we have a past. We know that we've been reclaimed by his grace. We know that we have a future because of who God is and all that he's done. Come, let us worship God together. Please join me in our call to worship. Once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we've received mercy. Once we were dead in our sin, but God, being rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. Behold the lavish love of God. We should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Come, let us worship God together. again. When we come to the holy presence of God and our own humanity is laid bare, when we stand in the living presence of truth and our own falsehood is revealed, people of God, let us acknowledge who we are and ask our ever-present God to forgive us. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have led us into the light. 
We thank you for sending the Savior to call us from death to life. We confess that we were dead in sin before we heard his call. But when we heard him, like Lazarus, we arose. But, O oh, Father, the grave clothes that bind us still, old habits that we cannot throw off, old customs that are so much a part of our lives that we are helpless to live the new life that Christ calls us to live. Give us strength, O oh Father, to break the bonds and give us courage to live a new life in you. Give us faith to believe that with your help, we cannot fail. All this we ask in the name of the Savior, whom has taught us to come to you. Amen. Please hear the assurance of forgiveness based on 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Hear the good news. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins and into his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive for all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Please join me in the prayer of illumination based on Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. Almighty God, you speak and chaos is transformed into order and beauty. You speak and captives are set free. You speak and storms are calmed. You speak words of life and the truth that set us free. Lord, we long for your word that we might be informed, transformed, and conformed to your will and your ways. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from uh, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Friends, listen to the word of the Lord. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said to him, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is one of the pinnacle conversion stories in all of Scripture. Uh, Saul, a persecutor of the church, becomes the, the, one of the greatest proclaimers uh, of the gospel. And it's always beneficial to hear a conversion story, to hear how someone brushed up with God's grace and how their lives were forever changed. There's that old hymn, I love to tell the story, uh, to those who know it best. I, we love to tell the story about uh, the radical nature of God's grace impacting someone's life because it not only reminds us of the nature of God's grace, it reminds us of how that grace has impacted our lives as well. So this is such a rich passage. What I want to do this morning is I really want to look at it as to what do we learn about the nature of God's grace and about how God approaches people. 
So let's just go ahead and begin. Uh, we notice that at the very beginning of this passage, uh, Saul is still doing what Saul has done. He's uh, now threatening and creating a way that he might arrest other people, other followers of Jesus, and bring them back. And for whatever reason, he's going to Damascus to do this. That was probably a, like a week's worth of walking. Uh, and what happens is that Jesus meets him right where he is. And that's a, a phenomenal thing about God's grace for us. Notice it doesn't say, and then God said, hey, Saul, if you get your act together, if you get your act cleaned up first, uh, then I could, could do something with you. No, it's precisely when uh, Saul is at his sort of most ravenous and most destructive to the church uh, that Jesus reveals himself in a brand new way to him. And that's a wonderful reminder of God's grace. Uh, so often we think we need to get our act together. We need to get our, ourselves cleaned up. Uh, we need to get right before we come to God. And it's actually by going to God that you get right at all. And so uh, the first important truth for us to remember is that God meets us where we are. And I love that it's on a journey. It's on a journey to Damascus. While he's still walking along the road, Jesus meets him, and that transformation begins. Second thing we notice from the passage is that uh, this passage is a wonderful reminder of the magnitude of God's grace. Uh, there's times that we wrestle with God's grace, and we wonder, you know, is, is it big enough for me? And yet as we think about this passage, we realize that if God's grace is big enough to transform the life of Saul, God's grace is big enough for us. Saul's not too far gone. And just to, to get a better window on uh, the concern about him, if we were to, to read forward in Acts chapter 8 or chapter 9 when uh, Saul eventually, uh, when God eventually calls Ananias to go see him, listen to what he says. Um, rise and go to Straight Street to the house of Judas, the man from Tarsus named Saul, and look for a man named Tarsus from Saul. For behold, uh, he was praying, and he has seen a vision that a man named Ananias will come in and lay hands on him, that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Ananias is saying, God, I understand what you're calling me to do, but do you understand who you're calling me to go to? Do you understand the amount of evil? And look what he says, the evil that he has uh, perpetuated in Jerusalem, and now I know he's got the authority uh, to arrest believers here. Saul was not a nice guy to other Christians. But look what God says. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. God's sovereign grace is so large that he chose Saul regardless of how far the other direction and how firm the other direction he was going. No one is beyond the reach of God's sovereign grace. Ananias was right to have concerns, and it's a great reminder for us that we don't check down to our human assessment of where other people might fit into the kingdom of God. One of the great challenges in the church is that we oftentimes sort of prejudge and preassess and sort of say, well, like that person I would like in my church. But the real question is, is who does God want to redeem, restore, and renew and bring into his church? And that really opens the door for us to see it in a completely different uh, angle. It really opens the door for us to be more open to what God is doing. We need to set aside our preconceived ideas about uh, who we might want, about our biases. We need to go out in faithfulness and say, you know, this is who I sense God is calling, and how might God use me to be a part of that process? No one is too far gone for the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The third point about God's grace that I want us to, to understand is that in this passage, we oftentimes read it to say it was this sudden thing. In fact, the word sudden is actually used uh, uh, in verse 3. Now, on his, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. 
Well, the light was suddenly, and all of a sudden there was this new appearance. But God's grace had been being revealed and unpacked to Saul for a long time. Uh, Saul was there when Stephen was stoned, and uh, he knew the Christ story, and he got to watch uh, faithfulness exuded through the life of Stephen. In fact, later in uh, Acts chapter 26, uh, verse 14, when the Apostle Paul tells this story again, what happened when uh, Jesus appeared to him, he's, Jesus says to him, why do you keep kicking against the goats? Why do you, you keep fighting this process that I've already began, basically? The implication is that Jesus had been reaching out and revealing himself in big and small ways through the testimony of others, through the faithful lives, even through uh, Old Testament verses that may have been brought to, to Saul's attention. No, this wasn't the first time that Jesus was uh, maybe in Saul's heart and on his mind. And it's a great reminder to us that although that uh, moment of conversion, that moment of understanding that God has been calling us might seem like this sudden thing, really as we look back, we see fingerprints that God was reaching out to us, God was calling us, God was speaking through other people to us for a long time. You know, God was uh, reaching out to Saul for a long time. This moment might have been a sudden moment of a new revelation, of a, a new experience that helped break through that and help Paul quit fighting the process, quit kicking against the goads. But God's long arc of love and grace had already been displayed to Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul. And that's an important reminder for us is that there's lots of seeds that get laid, and we can be a part of that seed laying. We can be a part of early testimony that begins to melt somebody's heart for Christ that the Holy Spirit will use to begin to open the door and to begin to think about uh, their own problem of sinfulness, their own uh, hopelessness, and the hope and the forgiveness and the new life that's available in Christ. No, God has been active in people's life much before this moment takes place. Uh, God has been convicting hearts and revealing himself in lots of different ways. And so although this light appears suddenly, God's been revealing himself to Saul. and God's been revealing himself to the people in your life and to, to you for a long time. Fourth point about God's grace. Um, it's based because Saul was called, but not compelled. You know, when Ananias uh, objects, God, the first thing God says is, uh, this is my chosen instrument. I picked Saul to be a servant for me. That's the wonderful thing that we, particularly in the Reformed tradition, hold on to. That God, before the foundations of the earth, God knew and called those who had come to understand who he is. And that overcomes Ananias' fear that if God called, then I, I need to, to get alongside of it. But called, oftentimes, sort of in our modern understanding, uh, must include the idea that he's compelled. But notice what doesn't take place in this passage. Jesus meets him and Paul, Saul answers, well, but who are you? And Jesus says, I am Jesus who you've been persecuting. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to continue to go to Damascus. And when you get there, I'll tell you what's next. He doesn't embarrass him. He doesn't convict him. He doesn't demean him. He doesn't compel him. He doesn't twist Saul's arm and say, from, from now on, you need to believe in who I am. He's been revealing himself. He, he's trying to display uh, the called nature that, that Saul has. God wants to use him for his eternal purposes, to reach out to the Gentiles in a new and a fresh way. But God doesn't force him. You know, and that's really in line with what we read at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus presents two ways of life, and he says, you know, you can build your house on the rock, or you can build your house in the sand, but go and choose. It's really what we read in the uh, pa parable of the, or the story with the rich young ruler. Uh, Jesus says, here's what you need to do. He, the young man comes and says, I want to live a better life. Jesus says, here's what you need to do. If you want to follow me, uh, sell all that you own and follow me. And the rich young ruler walks away. 
Jesus doesn't go around the corner and beat him up and say, look, I was trying to tell you to follow. The good news of the gospel is that we are called. And God overwhelms us with love. God continues to prompt and nudge our hearts. God continues to invite us to see that true life is in him. True hope is in him. That there is a joyful, abundant life that we can participate in right now. But God wants us to embrace his love. God wants us to willingly and freely respond to that love. And so here, Saul initially asks, who are you? This, this time of further discovery that his reason, that his intellect, that his, his rationale might wrestle with it and understand. And then eventually in Acts chapter 22, verse 10, he asks the next question, so what can I do for you, Lord? What shall I do? So God's grace meets us where we are. It reminds us that no one is so far gone. We remember that it might appear sudden, but God's actually been unpacking this and reaching out to us for a long time. Before we ever could love him, he first loved us. We'll realize it includes being called but not compelled. Then maybe the most startling thing about this passage, and really probably the most underpreached aspect of this passage, is that God uses other people to reveal the fullness of who he is. You know, when I first picked up this passage this week, I'll acknowledge I really wanted to preach the Ananias part of this passage. And that's really the challenge with how we're walking through the book of Acts. The passages are so big that we have to pick and choose. And the Ananias account is fantastic. But notice that God uses Ananias. God calls Ananias and says, I need you to meet him here. I need you to open his eyes and, uh, and sort of anoint him with the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will come upon him in a new and a fresh way. And Ananias does that. And Ananias has to get over his own fear, his own trepidation. He needs to engage in that faithful obedience to, to Jesus and to trust his call, not only on his own life to go and do this, but the call on Saul's life to become the Apostle Paul. Then if we were to continue to read through most of the rest of uh, chapter 9 in Acts, Ananias actually goes before Paul or with Paul everywhere that he goes. Because every place that he goes, people are like, wait a second, that's that guy. And so he needs someone to represent him. And notice how Ananias first greets him. Remember, he was fearful and, and was uh, not really in line with this plan at all. And then when he finally uh, addresses him, um, he basically lays his hands on him and says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you have come has sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Saul walked around in blindness for three days. He was told that someone named Ananias would meet him. And then Ananias shows up and speaks to him about being a brother in Christ the transformative nature of the gospel of Jesus. Minutes before, Ananias was fearful, but God's grace changed all that. And so God not only uses Ananias to be a blessing to Saul, but God uses Saul to display to us the change that takes place, that takes two people that were radically far apart, fearful of one another, and bring them together as brothers in Christ. So friends, there's much more in this passage, but this passage has to be proclaimed about the amazing, sovereign, saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I hope that your own understanding of his grace has been rekindled and renewed, and I pray that throughout the preaching of this word that you've been reminded that you're not too far gone. That God once met you where you are. That although it looks sudden in the time that you first understood it, you can look back and see the fingerprints of how God was reaching out to you for such a long time. That you understand that you were called by the richness of God's mercy and love for you, but never compelled, invited to come and enjoy this fabulous life that God calls us to. And that like Ananias, God is calling you to go make a difference in someone else's life by your obedience and by your proclamation of who Jesus Christ is. Amen.
let us continue to affirm our faith together as we share together in this passage from the Heidelberg Catechism. I am made right with God only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. As if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, as if I had been perfectly obedient, as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is accept this gift of God with a believing heart. When I say that by faith alone I am right with God, it is not because of any value my faith has that God is pleased with me. Only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness make me right with God. And I can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. Amen. Let us sing the wonderful hymn of the church, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, and Lord, what a foretaste of glory divine. Perfect delight 
Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for who you are. We thank you for your amazing grace. Your grace displayed in the lives of biblical characters like Saul, who became Paul. Grace that transformed someone from uh, an enemy and a persecutor of the church to one of its greatest proclaimers. Christ crucified. God, thank you for the way that you continue to enter into people's lives. You meet them exactly where we are. And your grace is substantial enough that no one is too far gone, no one is beyond hope. And that you continue to reach out. You continue to call people away from uh, broken understandings that we are the center of the, the world, broken understandings that there is no thing as sin, broken that we can self-justify. And we thank you for the work of the Spirit that not only convicts us of the truth about our brokenness and our need for a Savior, but also the truth that there is a Savior. And God, we rejoice in that moment when we suddenly first began to understand that uh, the love that is proclaimed in Scripture about Jesus is for us. But God, we pray that you would allow us to see how long you've been reaching out, how many people you work through. And God, we thank you that you've not only called us, but you invite us to participate in relationship with you, to participate in the new life that you're calling us to. We rejoice in this process of sanctification that you give us every day to grow up into Christ's likeness in every way. And we cannot move faster than the Holy Spirit will uh, guide us, but we can definitely move slower. You give us the invitation to willingly submit to the work you're doing in our lives. We might grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you that uh, you use people. Uh, you helped reach Saul through uh, Stephen's witness and testimony and through Ananias' obedience and servanthood. As we consider our own stories, we many of us have people that we can look back and know that you use them and give you thanks and praise for their faithfulness, for their obedience, and the blessing that uh, they've been to us. 
And God, we open our, ourselves up and ask that we would be willing vessels, that you would use us to do the same thing. We pray that you would continue to prompt our hearts. Uh, like Philip in the chapter before, that you would tell us where to go and that we would be uh, obedient up to that point that you want us to, to walk up to that chariot or that person. Like Ananias, that even when we are confronted with, uh, with fear, we would trust your calling greater than our emotional reaction. God, we rejoice that your grace has saved us and claimed us. We rejoice that it's not by the works that we've done, but by the work that Christ did. That we are saved by his grace through faith alone. God, thank you for the good news as it impacts our hearts and our lives. Help us not only uh, embrace our own story, help us continue to be bold and telling to others that we might encourage other believers and we might give hope to those who are trapped and mired in sin and despair. That in Christ, all things are possible. God, we continue to ask that you would bless your church. Your church and its uh, variety of incarnations, we pray that you would empower it, not only for faithfulness, but to make a meaningful impact, that we would be the blessing uh, that you seek to have us be to the rest of the world. You call us not only to be blessed, but to go out and be a blessing. Help us be known by our faithfulness to you, our faithful witness to you, but also our loving works. And God, we particularly pray right now for living hope uh, in this time of transition as uh, construction has started on our, our uh, new home. Uh, we pray that you would bless all those that are working on it and you would prepare our hearts, even now, uh, that we would begin to pray for the neighborhood that we'll be in. We would pray for this opportunity that we might uh, use us not to be a Christian clubhouse, but for it to be a mission location, uh, reaching out to people with good news. God, continue to be with uh, all those who are overseeing this process. Give them wisdom and guidance and particularly grace as uh, this process can sometimes be frustrating. But Lord, we just entrust uh, this season to you. We entrust this building to you that it be used for your glory. And God, we pray for our world. As this uh, season of uh, COVID continues to grow longer as uh, we once hoped that in a couple months we might be past this and as now uh, we're already past that deadline. Continue to sustain us with your grace. Continue to give us kingdom vision uh, that we might see this in the context of who you are and what you're doing in and through this. Let us not grow weary and impatient. Help us tend our hearts that when we do get impatient and weary and frustrated, that we would be quick to turn to you. That we confess the reality of where our hearts are and ask that you would fill us with your spirit and give us faithful and obedient hearts as we walk forward. God, we give you thanks and praise that you are concerned about us. You not only tell us to pray for daily bread, you ask us to pray that we might be forgiven. You care about us, and so help us, the church, continue to reflect that to the world. So be with the many that are going through difficult times. Be with those that are walking long roads of grief. Be with those who face financial challenges, who are unemployed and underemployed. Be with those who uh, continue to worry about details. Help us all feel your loving hands around us. Let us rest in your presence and delight in your love. So God, we pray this in all things in the strong and saving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we pray together the prayer which he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For your send moment today, I want you to encourage to be more like Ananias. A prayerfully seek God's heart to see who God is sending you out to, who God wants you to be an integral part in their discovery of God's grace and love through Jesus Christ our Lord. And like Ananias, be willing to do the wrestling. Be honest with God. But God, I don't want to go there. I don't like that person. I'm afraid of, uh, of that area or those people. And then listen for God's word. These are my chosen vessels. Let us be boldness enough in faith to be honest with God, but let us be obedient enough in faith to go where God is sending us. The great part about the faith is that it's not just for us, it's that we might glorify God in all that we do and all that we are. One of the foundational principles that we are called is we are made disciples who go out and make more disciples because that brings glory to God. So friends, be open and seek where God is sending you. And then go. Just as I am without one
Once again, I just want to thank you for joining us for this video worship experience. Rejoice to be a, a part of your faith life and journey. Uh, we pray that this service is a blessing to you. Now, as we prepare to go our separate ways, may you never forget it's by God's mercy that you were created, by God's amazing grace that you've been redeemed, and by God's constant love and provision for you, you were taken care of this day and forevermore. Now receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor in this day and forevermore. May the Lord be your peace. Amen.